Good morning. Welcome to our worship service this morning. It's good to be together. Thank you to the outreach, to the ensemble, to our singers uh, for a wonderful Robbie Burns last week. That was amazing. Uh, my uncle is signed on for next year. <laughs> it's, uh, it, was a, it was a great, great evening. And uh, I have to confess, I was going to show you pictures of it this morning, and I was all set to do it, and then David came through with the last reports I needed for the annual report, and that took priority. So we will get pictures of the Robert Birds. We have some nice ones. Uh, but thanks to, to Amanda and David, our annual report is almost ready to send out, so you'll see it at the beginning of the week, I hope. Um, so looking forward into this week, um, we have... Bible study on Tuesday, and we're looking at 2 Peter chapter 3. Worship and faith more information folks are reminded that we're meeting at 6.15 on Wednesday on Zoom, and uh, we've got lots of planning to do as we head into the spring and get ready uh, for my sabbatical later in the year. Uh, next Sunday, of course, there's choir practice on Thursday. Don't want to forget that. And you know, if any of you enjoy singing, I know they're always happy for new voices. Uh, next Sunday, I will be at, with the folks at Stone. They're having their annual worship and annual meeting on Zoom at 9.45. Uh, so the worship committee will have something in place. I promise. <laughs> and you will have worship here at 11.15. There may or may not be Zoom. I haven't figured that out yet, whether we can do their meeting. And I know, I know what we might do, but... Anyway, we'll, we'll figure that out, but uh, we, I hope there is because we like to record both services and, and blend them together. Uh, so that's next Sunday. Um, looking ahead, the ladies will be here Thursday, February 8th for Tea and Talk. And um, on February 10th, Stone is beginning their wellness series, and they're, we're really excited about it. We, our first speaker is Liz Kent from Victim Services, and she heard about our series last year, and she said, can I speak? I want to come and speak. And I don't know how familiar you are with Victim Services, but I had an experience with them in Clifford, where a, a younger father uh, died in the bathtub uh, across the road from us. And of course, you can imagine taking a body out of a bathtub, but all the complications. And Victim Services was there, and they were with the family, and they explained to them what would happen as the uh, emergency folk were working, and they brought in people to clean the house, and they brought in folks to help in many different ways. And so I think this is a great opportunity for us to find out about a group that's working in our county uh, on our behalf, and just know what they what they have to offer. So I'd love you to join us Saturday, February 10th at uh, Stone or on Zoom. Go to Eventbrite and sign up or just leave a phone message at the church and we'll add you to our numbers. Um, also, you, you would be able to watch it later on on Zoom. But I'd really appreciate if you'd invite your neighbors too. There's some little cards at the door. There's a couple posters. Tape them and drop them in mailboxes or, or whatever because um, at this point, we don't have a lot of people signed up, and we, Liz is a great speaker. We'd really like her to be well-received. Um, three weeks later, Sean James, if you know Master Gardener, Sean James is coming. He's a friend of Cases, and he's going to be speaking about nifty native plants. So that's the beginning. Uh, we've got somebody coming to talk about um, pharmacies and what pharmacists can do for you now. I think, I think Jill is coming from here. Uh, uh, a young woman that is a friend of my daughter's is going to come and speak about MAID, uh, Medical Assistance in Dying. Uh, we're talking about food security and the long-term effects of COVID. So this is over the next few months, but uh, please invite people to um, come and do sign up on Eventbrite so we know how many folks are able to join us. Um, also in your announcements, you'll see uh, Adrian Alder is singing uh, he has been singing this weekend and is singing this coming weekend in the uh, production of The Gondoliers by Gilbert and Sullivan. If anyone enjoys Gilbert and Sullivan, you might take advantage of that. Uh, there is a program online on Tuesday from the United Church called Reconciliation with Indigenous Peoples. You, uh, there's a panel that's going to speak on that. And uh, Trinity United in Acton has a uh, Valentine 
day T. You need to pre-order by February 3rd and then you go and pick up uh, your goodies on February 10th between 12 and 2. So those are some of the events coming up in, in our church and our wider community. Are there other announcements that folks have? Good news to share. Do you want to tell us more about the Robbie Burns? How are you? <laughs> well, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> it yes. was great. And raised over $1,000 for partners? Yes. Yes. yes, we did. Yeah. And uh, yes, everyone seemed to really enjoy it. And we did. Didn't we? we? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. Yeah. Um, but I should say, as a um, didn't join you for breakfast yesterday, but she uh, said that 75 years ago, she and her husband went to a Scottish, she thinks it was like a Robbie Burns, and she had always wanted to do that again. So a 75 year um, yeah. wish fulfilled. So that was really fun to hear. And the breakfast, did went? Like? Yes, the breakfast, we served 84 people, and this was the first breakfast that we've done since the, the renovation. And uh, the fans were, they were absolutely wonderful to have. Yeah. Like, the kitchen did not turn into a sauna, the floor stayed dry, we never uh, tripped the smoke alarm, and it was just, and, and it was so great to have lights over the stove. So that renovation was, was very life-changing, actually, for our breakfast. Yeah. Thanks to everyone who contributed to it. Yeah. Very cool. Other good news to share? Any birthdays to celebrate? Did I not hear you? you? Had some good news? Did your grandson? I just I just realized it was a while ago. I oh, it was a while ago. Oh, but I don't know that we heard about it. Yeah, <laughs> do you want to tell? No, but you could tell. Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> so her grandson Quinton Baumler uh, won gold at the National Youth Jumpers Association. I think it was this summer. I just looked it up on Instagram. Yeah. So, so uh, a gold at a national youth uh, jumping competition. Yes, Western. for Canada. For Canada. So yes. That's, that's exciting. Even if big, it's not big news, recent, big news, it's yeah. fun to know. And lets people know to watch for Clinton Donald. Yeah, yeah. It's getting ready for the Olympics. Yeah. For the Olympics. Yeah. Other things that you would like to share with us this morning. Good news is we have technology that I can run from the choir, so if I'm texting up here and talking to people, run. I'll go to church. <laughs> We well, light our candle for the good news we share, the good news in our hearts, and the good news that whatever is happening in our lives, God is with us. Let's pause and prepare our hearts as we listen to our gathering music.
Please join me in our call to worship. Come and praise the Lord. Gather us as a community of faith. We give thanks to God for our whole hearts. The Holy One's works are great, and we find joy in them as we share the stories of God's action in the world with one another. The works of the Lord are full of honor and majesty, and God's righteousness endures forever. Known by wonderful deeds, God is gracious and merciful. Let us worship the one who offers us grace and mercy with song and silence, prayer and praise. Let us pray. Let our Jewish siblings be gathered to hear your word for our lives, O God. Like that again and again, we are surprised by the difference knowing Jesus makes in our lives. Help us to open our hearts and minds to your authority. So that as Jesus is ours, we can bring love and healing to your world. Amen. Please, jo Please join in singing um, Voice of the Eye 223, Eternal Unchanging, we sing. Friends, hear the good news. Whatever's happening in our lives and in the world, whatever we thought or said or done that's let God down or hurt another, we are forgiven and we are loved. Amen. And join me in our gospel reading from Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. And for the men, I'll tell you that the next slide, you start the reading. And then on the third slide, the women start the reading. So, so Mark 1, 21 to 28. They went to Capernaum, and when Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know you are. 
But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him, and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Next hymn, a 620 silent, strengthy, unclean spirit. We're singing to the tune of 374, so don't follow the notes. <laughs> to worship. Pra worship included prayer and sacrifice and singing. But so often the Jewish people had been dispersed to other places far, far from the temple. And so they had developed by the time Jesus was um, ministering um, home worship, the services that they could do within their family. And then whenever there were 10 families in a community, they would be um, make up a synagogue, and they would come to synagogue, but I think when we read synagogue, I don't know about you, but I read it, oh, worship like we do, uh, but it was actually not quite like that. Synagogue was actually a place of teaching, so they did the same. They did, they did pray, but, but there was teaching, and there was no preacher. Uh, what would happen was there was a ruler of the synagogue, and it was his job to administer the services, and to set them up, and and he then looked around this morning and said, oh, let me see. Chris, this morning you'll be preaching for us. So this is the passage and share your wisdom. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how a preacher was chosen. Now, it did say in the commentary I read that they chose somebody that was competent. So, um, you know, some of us might have been left out. But, uh, but they, uh, the, the ruler would, would find somebody to share their learning and their wisdom on the scripture of the day. 
the distributor of the alms, they did collect an offering, and they were required to take care of the poor. And the poorest of the poor, they actually gave 14 meals a week to. So two meals a day, and I think, wow, that's, that's different than, than the way we care for people now. The, uh, the other person was the Hassan, and he taught the children, and he cared for the biblical scrolls, because of course all their readings were in scrolls. And so he would preserve the scrolls, and he would roll them out to the right place on the Sabbath morning, and then he would blow the trumpet and invite people to worship. Now there were scribes who studied the law, and they actually administered the law as well. And sometimes they would be chosen to, to preach as out of the midst. And other times, different people like a, a passing rabbi, like Jesus, would be invited to lead worship. But the scribes, when it was their turn to teach, would have focused on the law, because that was their focus. They knew all the oral laws by heart that had developed to help keep people faithful to the Ten Commandments and the 639 laws of Moses in scripture. If a, if a problem arose between two people, the scribes were the ones that came and adjudicated it. They would find a solution, and often then they'd make a new law so that you wouldn't get there again. And so they had this vast amount of laws for people to follow um, so that they could remain faithful to the Torah, to the laws of Moses, and through them to God. Now it would be easy for us to criticize the scribes, and it's been done often, saying, well, they had a religion and they turned it into legalism. They made everything so legalistic. But that, I think, comes from our binary way of seeing things. Something's good or bad, right or wrong. But in fact, what they were doing was they were focused on keeping the law so that they could keep people connected to God. They were focused on keeping the law so they could keep the community together. They were doing what they had inherited. It's easy to say they were too focused on the law and were inferior to Jesus, but the truth was so much more complex than that. The people who gathered had come to hear God's word and to study how it would shape their lives, just as we come here each Sunday to hear scripture and to to talk about how it impacts our lives. The scribes and the teachers faithfully followed the practice of guiding people in the law that they had been taught. It's true that the law had become more and more complicated, but the goal was still the same. The goal was to keep people faithful to God and keep them in relationship with one another. It was, above all, to keep the commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus knew that the best place to find people who would be open to God's new possibilities for the world was in the synagogue, because they were there already with the words of scripture and wanting to learn from them. Unlike the scribes who were passing down what they had learned, Jesus was bringing the kingdom of God near by being God's presence in the community. The unclean spirit that possessed the man was the only one to recognize Jesus. And he called out, Holy One of God, get away from me. Because he knew Jesus' power. He knew who Jesus was. Jesus called the spirit out of the man. And those gathered in the synagogue wondered where his authority had come from. Think of the different perspectives of the people gathered. The disciples had come with Jesus, and they were beginning to understand that he was special. John had told, him, told them he was the Lamb of God, and, but it wouldn't be until his death and resurrection that they would confidently say that he was the Messiah. Some of the crowd heard his teaching and saw the healing and followed him. They believed immediately. Others, and I'm afraid this is where I would be, were a little more skeptical, like, this was good, but what does it mean? And, and they wondered and waited. The scribes might already have been started to be cautious of Jesus, or maybe even adversarial to him, 
because he had power that they didn't have, and they could easily see him usurping their position. I trust that the man that had been possessed was relieved and grateful and was able to be restored to his family and community. You might have wondered about the picture on, on the slide this morning, but in thinking about this, I was thinking about a puzzle that you try putting things together. And I've heard, I've never done one, but there's puzzles that have all the same shaped pieces. So it can go together and not be the picture that was intended. And I was thinking about how um, the countless ways you could put different things together. And depending on where the influence is coming from, one picture might seem good, and for another group, another picture might be good. But for the picture to be the one that moves us towards God's kingdom, it has to be one that's good for everybody. As we listen to world events, it would be easy to assume that we can sort out the right and wrong in any situation. My sense from this story of the healing in the synagogue is that life is never that simple. It's always far more complex. Some people and politicians in the United States and more recently in Canada and around the world are suggesting that countries should close their borders and keep out refugees and foreign students and immigrants because they take jobs and housing and medical care from citizens. People who take this position in the media never say what's supposed to happen to those people fleeing from Ukraine and Russia, Gaza and Syria, Afghanistan and other poverty and war-torn countries. What about those people leaving countries where they would be killed for being LGBTQ2 plus? The concern of keeping people out is what's good for us. What about our brothers and sisters and siblings? <coughs> As I listened to Tom Power interview Kim Thue, a Vietnamese Canadian author who wrote the book Rue, which is now a movie that's uh, playing right now. I was reminded of the time in our uh, church congregation when we were going to bring a Vietnamese boat family into our church. And we were sitting in the parlor and, and very well-meaning people said, but the parents in this family are old. <coughs> they, uh, they only speak Vietnamese. Uh, they're going to end up on welfare. And what's that going to do to our society? These folks they were salt of the earth people. They were thought they were being well-meaning. But what about that family in a, in a refugee camp, waiting for a place to be? Somebody in the group shared the wisdom that, well, that family probably would indeed end up on welfare, the parents. But the children would be raised here, and they would be able to grow in uh, Canadian society, and, and they would be assets to our society. Kim Thuê uh, was born in Vietnam in 1968. She says she came from a family of scholars. In 1978, her family fled a, a very well-off lifestyle by boats that, of course, some didn't make it. And they ended up in Malaysia, where they didn't have a sheet of plastic to make a tent for their family. After that time in Malaysia, they arrived in Granby, Quebec, in the middle of snow. Everything was white, and she described it as so pure, because the people in Granby received them and loved them without knowing their names, without them being able to speak a word of French to thank them, or English. She said, in fact, they weren't even speaking much Vietnamese, because being a, a very reserved people, and this war-torn country they were living in, it, it was easier just not to talk, and so they weren't communicating a lot. But here they were received with openness and love. She said that many Canadians now are talking different about immigration. And she invites us to pause and to see taking in refugees as not an act of charity, but of adoption. 
She said refugee sponsorship is an investment not only in the refugee, but also our country. There were 13 people in her family that came at that time. She has, uh, in her lifetime, been um, an author, a restaurateur, a seamstress, a lawyer, uh, an interpreter, and now she's a, a writer and a film producer. But she said in those other 13 people, they now have a net worth of $30 million. And they include an architect, a computer scientist, uh, an actuary that has returned to Vietnam and is, um, owns a large uh, business there, a dentist, a lawyer. She says people can choose how they see that net worth. They can see it as adding to Canadian society, or they can say it's taking away from Canadians. Kim points out that both explanations are logical, depending on your perspective, depending on where your influences are. Her hope in telling her story is to help people see refugees as people and to understand what receiving them means. She thinks because we need, she thinks we need refugees who have survived um, police and war and armies and the sea because she says they have to become superhuman to survive and they will contribute to our society. As we watch our society become more polarized in the media, the story of the synagogue invites us to look at the complexities of life, to understand that each position comes from a particular place of life experience. And Jesus came not just to heal the man possessed by the demon, but to call all people together to respond to one another in love. The puzzle that is our world will not be complete for everyone to enjoy until it is assembled in a way that leaves no one homeless or hungry, hurt or disadvantaged. We need to listen to one another with compassion and listen for God's voice so we can be a part of building the puzzle of God's kingdom where all people have a place in it. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>
Adam Glenn, you can shout out the title and we can find it together. 646, we are marching. <laughs>
uh, turn to your neighbor or walk across the church and find somebody to talk to and talk about where is it challenging to hear God's voice? Where is it challenging in the midst of all the voices we hear to, to know where God is calling us to? This is uh, the time in our worship where we think of all that God has given us and we offer our gifts and gratitude and, and once in a while somebody will say, how come we don't take the offering anymore? <laughs> well, we do take the offering. Uh, you gratefully offer it through car and through e-transfers and checks and, and of course there is a play back there for those that need it, but, uh, but you also offer through your time singing and uh, caring for our property and, and looking after the cemetery and, and all the many, many things that you do, caring for the, the wellness series. And you offer gifts in so many ways and, and we are grateful. Let us pray. Generous God, this is our church family. We are grateful to, to gather here and to come to know you more fully in this place. And we offer ourselves and our gifts trusting that you will use them and us to make a difference in your world. Amen. Uh, Nancy Fountain called me to say that her father, George, had died, and we'll share that obituary uh, with you in contemplation and, and conversation today. Uh, let us pray. Creator God, we give thanks for your good earth and for all the benefits it has for us. We see, too, the harm that has been done to it um, through uh, mining, through, the, the, uh, through our cars and, and different industries, through our waste. We pray that you would show us ways to change our interaction with the earth to help it heal and restore itself. God, wherever people are experiencing war, violence, injustice, or abuse, we pray for your peace. We think of the people of Ukraine and Russia, Israel and Gaza and the Sudan. We ask that a path forward might be found that cares for all people and helps people find peace. God, we think of the refugees from those situations and, and from countless other around the world. And we ask that people's hearts might be opened to help find new homes and safe homes. In our prayer cycle, we lift up to you the people of Algeria, Libya, Morocco, Western Sahara, and Tunisia. God, we are aware that uh, even in our country, people are facing discrimination every day. And we ask for changes of heart so that our Black First Nation, Métis, South Asian, LGBTQ2S plus siblings might find this a safe and good place to live. God, where people are struggling with physical and mental illness, we can govern from accidents and surgery. We pray for healing and hope. We ask for strength and patience for caregivers. Where people are struggling with relationships, we ask for loving paths forward. We pray for companionship for the lonely and refuge for the homeless. And God, we pray for your church, wherever people gather to worship, might we find community that sustains us and ways to reach out and make a difference in your world. We pray for our congregations of stone and rockwood, asking your blessing on each person gathered here and those who can't be with us. We pray for the Howard family as they mourn the death of Chris's brother, Stephen, for the Fountain family on the death of Nancy's father, George, for Bet, Bill, Dawn, Deborah, Doug and Virginia, Evelyn, Georgina, Grace, Harry, Heather, Joan, Kathy, Ken, Linda, Mabel, Marion, Mary, Mike, Paul, Roy, Ryan, Sebastian, Sandy, Sarah, Tammy, Fane, Wendy, and Victoria. We pray for our partners in the Shinabit Outreach, the Canadian Food Games Bank, East Wellington Community Services, Mission and Service, and the Rural Women's Support Program. We pray for the breakfast programs in our local schools that they would help children be fed and learn. 
We pray for Tom Marie's Community Center and Rhode City Mission and Holcombs, for Everton Community Church, for Blythe United, for Eastern Ontario, Udaway Regional Council, and the members, friends, ministers, and staff of our United Church in Western Ontario Waterways, across Canada and around the world. God, hear our prayers, spoken and unspoken, and answer in your life. We pray this as we pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I did. Please join in singing our closing hymn, More Voices 120, My Soul Cries Out.
friends, we are a part of building God's puzzle of a new kingdom. May we find the way to discern God's voice in the cacophony of voices so that we can make a difference in God's work. Go now in the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, this day and always. <coughs>